size group one cubic. Oh. Still haven't mastered this one. Yeah, it's a couple of 15 seconds fast. <laughs> Should not be so lucky. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I know, but it goes on. Right, right. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody, everybody for coming. I, and of course, thank you to Stuart for organizing this and thinking about it. And thank you to all of you for participating. I just want to um, define a little bit more clearly the purpose of tonight's talk. Subsequent evenings will be how a person's supposed to sound as a chassan. So I was asked to come to discuss how a person's not supposed to sound as a chassan. I will be singing for the next 45 minutes. And um, the, the, the good news is you'll all feel better about yourselves as chassanim once I'm done. Um, but I, what I would like to do, it's, 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 it's not correct to say it's a stream of consciousness because I have notes, but it's, it's notes of streams of consciousness of mine uh, over the last uh, number of days. I would like to start with just some general thoughts about what it is to be a chazen, and then we'll go through some halachos. Looking around the room, there's a very wide range of knowledge and background in the room, so I'm sure everyone is going to hear things that they already know. I hope everyone is going to hear things that they maybe don't know, and hopefully it'll be helpful to everybody in their own way. Um, we'll start for a few minutes just talk about some of the outlook of being a chazen. I always am very fascinated when technical aspects of halacha end up being very revealing of an outlook of Judaism, which is as follows. A person could have the most beautiful of voices, and if he's in Avelos, if he's in mourning, let's say for the 12 months for a parent, he's not supposed to dive in for the Amid on Shabbos or Yom Tov. There are some exceptions in unique circumstances, but the standard halacha is a person in Avelos doesn't dive in for the Amid on Shabbos or Yom Tov. What a, what a strange halacha. Why, why is that so? And the basic explanation for this very basic halacha is that when someone is diving on Shabbos and Yom Tov, there's supposed to be a sense of simcha, there's supposed to be a sense of joy in one's tefillah, and we're concerned that the chazen won't have, if he's in mourning himself, won't have the proper expression of joy for the sake of the congregation. What a fascinating statement, because what that means is the congregation, A, is really living vicariously through the chazen. And I want to be very clear, we all have our personal prayers, the chazen could be wonderful, the chazen could be awful, it's up to us to make the dabbing meaningful, but the bottom line is there's a connection to the chazan. And the other thing is there's a concept there that presumably the emotions of the chazan should in some way be reflected in a meaningful way in his leading of the tefillah. Which is just a, a, a powerful thing to think about. I mean, most of us, I think, are just trying to figure out how to sing the tune right and say the words right. And, and there's this whole other component, and, and it really speaks to... The, the, the normal term for what it is to be a chaz is not chaz, and the normal term is to be a shliach tzibur. You're the messenger of the congregation. And, and, and they send you there. And if you ever want to think about what it is to really be a shliach tzibur, just look at the beautiful tefillah that the chaz says before Musaf on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And I, if, if you ever want a drop of inspiration, just read the English. It's, it's the, most, the most beautiful of things. And it's this perspective that a person is representing the community. Um, by the way, the Magen of Rum says, he says this specifically in the context of the high holidays, but it's interesting to think about in general, that the person who serves as chazen should be a person who understands the needs of the generation. That if at all possible, again, my great-grandmother had a wonderful Yiddish phrase, which I will not try to say, but basically all in one you'll never find, but, but theoretically speaking, one of the ideal things that we look for is a person who understands the needs of the people. And that's part of the role of being the chazan. Uh, by the way, as an aside, another aspect of the chazan, it should be a person that the congregation looks at as being uh, an upright um, model individual. That's also something uh, interesting to think about. Um, the morale says, says a fascinating thing. I'm sure many of you have heard before of the famous Medrash that when God taught Moshe the 13 attributes of mercy, he was wrapped in a talus like a chazan. And, and he taught him the 13 attributes of mercy. So whatever exactly this means anyway, but Moshe saw an image. We could have a whole discussion of what that means. But Moshe saw an image of God coming up as if wrapped in a talus like a chazan. What's the significance of him being wrapped in a talus like a chazan? So the Maral says a fascinating thing. If you imagine a person standing with his talus over his head, 
can't see one way or the other. It's kind of like blinders. It's, you really don't see either side. You're just focused straight ahead. That's the ideal model. It's not just for a chassan. That's the ideal model for anyone in prayer. But that's the ideal model of the person standing as a chassan. That it's just focused on, on the direction straight ahead of him and not no distractions. And, and if you think about it also, so that means that it's an elevated responsibility of the person serving as chassan not to be distracted by our own shtuyot, our own silliness. And, and it's you're really representing the community at this moment. It's just this image of, of the extreme mode of just being straight ahead and nothing but HaKadosh Baruch Hu and the needs of the tzibur. <coughs> um, many people find themselves uh, serving most frequently as chazan when they are in mourning, uh, specifically in mourning for a parent. What's the idea of Dabit Ahmed when, when someone is in mourning for a parent? I emphasize the primary idea of Davin to the is specifically mourning for a parent, not for other relatives. It's nice, but the primary thing is for a child mourning a parent. And the idea is that the merit of a person inviting the congregation to say, Amen Yehishmei Rabba, and, and, and to have all these brachos and saying Amen to these brachos, every time that happens is considered a tremendous merit. So it's just, it's worthy, worthy of thinking about every now and then when, I'm, when a person's getting up to Davin, why are they getting up to Davin? Because this is a golden opportunity to invite Cloud Israel to sing praises to God. And here it is, I'm going to be the one who's going to do that. Interesting. One more thing that I, 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 I personally find very powerful, um, and then we'll get into some halachos, is um, you know, the idea of the chasen's repetition of Shemona Esri used to be a very technical, technically important thing. There were people who didn't know the words of Shemona Esri. And either they weren't Sidurim or they couldn't read the Sidurim, so what are you going to do? So the, everybody would dive into the Sidurim, and then whoever wasn't comfortable would wait. And the chasen would say the whole Shemona Esri again out loud, and you'd say it along with them if you didn't know the words. Uh, thank God that's, that's very rarely needed today. So what are we, what are we saying Chazar Sashat's for? Um, to clarify, the answer is not to give people time to catch up with their neighbors. That's not, uh, that's not the reason. Um, the real reason is to give the rabbi time to think about his drasha. Um, but, um, so, the, 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 te- the most technical of answers is because we still have the practice just in case that someone doesn't know. But there is an idea, some of the commentators say, that if there was any bracha in my private Shemona that I didn't really focus on appropriately, if I listen to the Chazan's Shmona, uh, repetition and he says a bracha and I really appropriately focus on it, then it's as if I said the bracha appropriately. So this is, it's a, it's a neat way to think about Chazar Sashats, which is, I think for many people who serve as Chazan, one of the greatest challenges, it's so much pressure. You have to get through all this, and especially if it's a weekday minute, there's all this time pressure. And the idea that, that you're really giving everybody else a second shot is, is I think, just the just neat thing uh, to think about. Okay, yes. Yeah. What I unfortunately daven slowly. Okay. And frequently, by the time the, the, uh, they're doing Chazar Sashat and they get to the, um, uh, the Kedusha, or, uh, I'm usually not there yet. So I have to do, you know, Shomei Kona. I have to listen and, and think, you know, the yeah. words as, as the Chazar is saying. So for me, that's like incredibly important that the Chazar would stop and say it slowly and clearly, you okay. know. You because know, essentially, saying, he's saying it for me because yeah. I can't, because I'm still in the middle of my You know what, we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later, God willing. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit, God willing. Yeah, mm-hmm. thank you very much. And any, any comments about anything we've said so far? Because a lot of this stuff we're going to touch on as, as we go. Mr. Ace? A professional has an even if he's an auto, he'll not be. Right, so, so ba- basically the, the gist is that many aspects of mourning, if it's... If, if a person's practice of mourning ends up being a public demonstration of mourning on Shabbos or Yom Tiv, we're very wary of that. So that's true, that's true for uh, professional chazam writers. If a person goes to a shul and every Shabbos so-and-so is the one who davens for the Amid and that's been his job for the last 25 years, and all of a sudden he's not doing it, though he's being passive, that's looked upon as, as a public demonstration of mourning, which we stay away from on, on, on Shabbos and Yom Tiv. And, and sometimes in, in situations even people who aren't professional chazam might be such regulars that, that uh, Certain, certain circumstances, they might be asked to have it anyway, but that, that, so it's sort of an exception to the rule. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that was just a little bit to think about in the context of Dabin for the Ahmed. I, I'd like to kind of go through a little bit, beginning to end, 
I'm thinking primarily of the weekday davening here, but the vast majority of the things will have places in the Shabbos of the davening too, of sort of halachic notes vis-a-vis -vis the experience of the chazan. So if we're really going in, in, in order of uh, sequential order, there, there, it's funny, a lot of people don't realize their halach is about being yes to daven. Uh, it's, it's, I, I'm not sure how much I would advise this practically, but um, <clears throat> technically speaking, if, a guy, if someone asks you to daven for the Amid, you're supposed to turn it down. You're supposed to, you're supposed to turn it down the first time, uh, and then the second time you're supposed to say, well, I don't know, and then the third time you're supposed to go up to daven. I would not recommend that uh, practically. Uh, God boy, you have a hard enough time and, and uh, no one else is doing that. So if you say no the first time, don't expect them to ask you the second time. Um, but what, what is clearly a message from this, which I think is relevant, is a person's not supposed to be, uh, you know, like staking out his turf uh, to daven for them. And of course, you know, a person has your side, a person has a chiyov, it makes sense to stand for it. But, uh, you know, many times in a shul, in a minion, there'll be a number of people who are chiyovim. You know, the normal, as this Baruch Hashem is very common in our shul, the normal mental thing is people kind of wait their turn and, and uh, either they have a system among themselves or the Gabi will tell them, you know, when it is. But the, the ideal model is not, forgive the wording, be boxing out everybody else to make sure uh, you get to top of the moment. It's not, it's not the way we really uh, do things. Um, it's also an interesting thing, also specifically, specifically cited in Shulchan Aruch. Let's say for whatever reason it is, a person really wanted to daven for the Amid. Um, let's say he had your side or something like that. You know, it was, it was a way to give honor to one's parents. And, and for whatever reason, the congregation had something else in mind. Uh, what I, I think is probably most likely is there was more than one person he had, uh, had a chiv that day. You know, and here, so it's, 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 it's a terrible uh, moment. A person has this opportunity to do something to honor a parent's memory and then something happens and they're not able to do it. Maybe if I back down, I'm not paying my parents uh, proper respect. And it's very clearly not that way in halacha. It's just a, a good thing to realize also in, 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 in the end of the day, what we're, the greatest way to bring our parents respect and our parents the shamos respect is to do the right thing. And it's not considered the, the, the Jewish way uh, to, I don't care what the guy says, I don't care what the community says, I'm dominant, that, 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 that's not our way. It's a good story to, to keep in the back of one's mind because there are there are situations every now and then. Um, I'll just I'll just share with you. I, I probably have shared this with some of you privately before. Uh, I once saw a story um, that there was a fellow who was sent on some outreach task uh, by the Chazonish. The Chazonish was as letter of the law as they came <laughs> in terms of halachic authorities, uh, famously so. So. He, he was sent to some kind of far, far-flung community. He was in Israel uh, to speak about some topic on Shabbos, and he got to the community Friday afternoon, and he saw that uh, uh, you know what, whatever the mechitza was there was really not uh, not something that he felt comfortable doubting. And I guess he was a student of the Chazanish; he probably got high standards. But whatever, whatever his bottom line, whatever the story was exactly. Uh, he came and he, he felt he did not feel comfortable uh, uh, dabbing there, and that was fine, you know, he dabbed in the privacy of his hotel. And, uh, you know, he came and he did whatever he was supposed to do over Shabbos. He gave his talks and whatever it is, that was fine. He was mortified because he realized at some point over Shabbos that he actually had your insight that day. And uh, so here it is, like, what a hear it, you know. I, I, he didn't even say Kaddish, he didn't even dabbing with the Amid. He didn't even dab with the Minyan, you know, because he had, you know, and gosh, and he came back, he was really dejected. He came back to the Chasanish. He said, "How could I have not honored whichever parents it was?" Uh, you know, the Chasanish said, "What do you mean? You schlepped so and so a place just to just to spread some educational message? What greater thing could you do for for your parents' soul than that?" And I said, "In the end of the day, we try to do good things, and and doing good things that's the greatest." Source. So certainly, when we're davening for the Amid and in memory of parents and everything like that, the most important thing is to do it in in an appropriate way. Um, okay. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about Kaddish. Of course, uh, Kaddish could, could be said by uh, mourners, whether or not they're doubting for the Amid, but in the context of doubting for the Amid, this is also true. Um, first of all, traditionally, we keep our feet together during Kaddish. 
Uh, that's traditionally true even for the half Kaddish. Uh, maybe we should explain a moment what kind of Kaddishim there are in the first place. Kaddish acts as a little bit of a bookmark within davening. So basically when a section of davening either is ending or beginning, frequently we mark it with a recital of the Kaddish. So for example, you think about um, Yishtabach. Yishtabach is the closure of Pesukah Zimra. Like there's a bracha at the end of Yishtabach, which is the closure of Pesukah Zimra. Then we say Kaddish to end up Pesukah Zimra, and then we go into Baruch which is the beginning of Shema and its brachos. All the Kaddishim are like that. They play some closing or opening role. Uh, the difference between a whole Kaddish and a half Kaddish is that traditionally at the end of a tefillah, there's a Kaddish to Skakel. See, in other words, any, you'll, every time you look at the davening, every Shemona Esrei is ultimately followed by a Kaddish to Skakel. I'm, I'm, just not, I'm not going to take comments for now. Every Shemona Esrei is ultimately followed by a Kaddish to Skakel because the point is the line of to Skakel is, is a prayer that God should accept our tefillahs. Almost every Kaddish to Skabel is, um, is following a, a Shemona Esrei or Kaddish's repetition or something that came after a Kaddish's repetition. But any time we say Kaddish, we traditionally keep our, our feet together. Um, there is a halachic idea of bowing. You see it. Uh, there's a halachic idea of bowing four different places in Kaddish. Um, the very beginning, and this is not a major thing if someone doesn't do this, but this, just the extent we're having this class, there is such a concept. The very first word of Kaddish is Yiskadel. By the way, you get different pronunciations, Yiskadel, Yiskadal. Either one is okay. Uh, it's probably more popular to say Yiskadel, but either one is fine. Uh, so at, at, at Yiskadel, a person bows. Um, at Yeheshmei Rabbah, a person bows. At Yisparach, which is the beginning of the second paragraph, um, a person bows. And Daviran Bialma, the Ru Amen, at the end of the second paragraph of Kaddish, a person bows there. These are considered like, like significant moments in the Kaddish. Again, so at Yiskadal, at Yeheshmei Rabbah, at Yisparach, the beginning of the second paragraph, and at the closure of the second paragraph, Daviran Bialma, the Ru Amen. Now, uh, Moshe Bear referred to an important thing before which is something called Shomea Ka'one. If people are behind in Davin, and they're in places in the Shmona, in, in Davin that they can't answer the Kaddish, they are supposed to, in certain circumstances, live vicariously through the Chazan. Now, it's very hard to live vicariously through the Chazan if they can't hear the Chazan. So uh, this, of course, is a good pitch for Davin loud and clear uh, at all times. Um, but besides that, specifically, Yehei Shmei Rabbah, if a person, for example, is saying Kaddish after Shmon or something like that, and maybe there's still people talking Shmon Esrei, it's a very worthwhile thing to make sure, as the Chazan, to not say Yehei Shmei Rabbah until everyone said Yehei Shmei Rabbah. And then you say it kind of loud and clear and slow, so that if anybody needs you, they can, they can listen to you about that. There is a concept of you beginning Yehei Shmei Rabbah just slightly while some people are still saying it, so that you can be part of the minion saying Yehei Shmei Rabbah. If that made sense to everybody. Um, when it's a Kaddish that a person takes three steps back for, a Kaddish with Osesh Shalom and Rumab, this could be the whole Kaddish or the mourner's Kaddish, um, one is supposed to take three steps back before saying Osesh Shalom. In other words, uh, again, a lot of people do this, but it's not so. We, we don't like go, don't go back while we're saying Osesh Shalom and Rumab. We're supposed to take three steps back, and then Osesh Shalom and Rumab, we have Sesha Valenu, Okay. Um, any Kaddish questions? Again, very, very local to Kaddish. Any Kaddish questions? Ray? I thought you, the class is supposed to say it at the same time, Yehesh maybe louder. But so, really so candidly, if it's a small enough minion, you can say it at the same time, just loud, and whoever needs to hear you can hear you. If it's a large minion, it's not going to work very well. So that's why I was saying this thing that kind of begin it, just as the yeah, last remnants you. are finishing off, so you're uh, technically saying it with the minion, but a person who's listening for you can, can hear you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. For, for me, you, you just said something that contradicted something I thought I had learned, maybe I wouldn't have done it properly. But when you, so you go back and you say, I thought it was, you take one step back, you go, Ose Shalom, Bimama, Huya Ase Shalom. I, mean, I, I don't think it, that's correct. Not, not that, I, you do see people do that, but I don't think that's correct. That's not correct. Not true, so. Okay, I'm sorry. It's, no, it's fine. Take for a raise again. So you're saying you should get, take three steps take back three steps and then do your battle to left, to the right, and to the center. That's what I would say. Yeah. That's what I would say. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for raising it. Okay. Um, so now if we're going through the davening, so the, 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 there was a Kaddish near the beginning, uh, you know, Pesukah de Zimra, Kaddish again, Baruch Hu, and now we get to 
the brachos preceding Kriya Shema and Shema itself. So first of all, just to explain something that people might wonder about sometime. The second bracha which precedes Shema, Habocher Bamo Yisrael Biyahava, um, in a sense is considered a bracha on the Shema. In other words, even though we don't say Shema in that bracha, we don't say, thank you Hashem for giving us the mitzvah of saying Kriya Shema, that bracha is considered a joined to Shema, and there's a whole question in halacha if it's appropriate to interrupt in any way between the words Habocher Bamo Yisrael Biyahava at the end of the bracha and Shema Yisrael. And therefore, you'll, you'll notice many times that people in a minion, when you're finishing off, will try to time themselves to say it with you. And we, of course, all know that if you have 30 people in a room all trying to say it at the exact same moment, it's going to go wonderfully. But that's, that's <laughs> a, a little bit neither here nor there. But, but the bottom line is, um, just so people shouldn't be surprised, that's why that is. Uh, just as an aside, if a person doesn't say it specifically with the chazan, uh, it is acceptable and fine to say amen to that bracha, but there's an idea of kind of saying it with the chazas, so there's no question of saying amen. Now, there's a very interesting issue specifically about Shema. So chazas is the last words of things, like anything, like any paragraph, any bracha, chazas is the last words. So let me just pose a question that my guess is some people in the room wonder about sometimes. It's a very common question. If I'm a chazan, am I supposed to have said those words already? Am I not supposed? Am I not supposed to have said those words already? Like, which one is it? So the normal answer is I'm not supposed to have said those words already. In most places, when I say something at the end, I should just wait a moment uh, while everyone else is saying those last words, and then when I think it's a good time, I should say those last words for the first time. There's one exception to the whole album to that, and the one exception is at the end of Shema. And the reason why that is is uh, the number two hundred and forty-eight corresponds to uh, parts of the body. We're very big on 248 in the context of Shema, and the words of Shema come out at 245. And uh, so we're, we're three short. So therefore, when the Chazan says at the end, Hashem Elokeichem Emes, we kind of all live by carousel through the Chazan, and so that gets us up to 248. But the Chazan deserves to be up to 248 also. And the only way the Chazan's going to get up to 248 is if he said Hashem Elokeichem Emes privately, and now I'll repeat it. But I just want to be very clear, that's the only part of the davening the chazan was supposed to say and then repeat. Everything else, uh, just wait a moment while they're finishing and then you'll, you'll say it when it's appropriate. Okay. Um, another issue that, that comes up, similar to what we talked about a few moments ago with the bracha, is there's an idea of being somech ke'ulat vila. Uh, adjoining the bracha of Ga'al Yisrael to Shemona Esrei. It's actually a really neat thing to think about. Ga'al Yisrael is all about the recognition that God saved the Jews from Egypt, and we go directly from that recognition into discussing our personal relationship with God. And it's that we see our, our discussion of our needs, our praise of God, all inherently connected to the discussion of God taking the Jews out of Egypt. So that, again, we're really supposed to adjoin it as much as possible. So this is an old question. Um, What's the chazan supposed to do? You don't want to put the minion in a situation where they have to say amen to the bracha because you want them to be able to say Baruch Hashem Gal Yisrael and go straight at the Shemona Esrei. So there are two things that are commonly done. Um, one thing that's commonly done is the chazan goes quiet. Uh, you know, kind of says the words and then at the very end, Baruch Hashem, he kind of whispers while he's to himself. So no one has that amen question because they didn't hear the chazan anyway. Uh, there are sources for doing that. There are sources for doing that. Uh, to be candid, that's not the most advised approach in halacha. The most advisable approach in halacha is that the, the chazan says the bracha of Gal Yisrael, and the people finish off the bracha of Gal Yisrael at the same time as the chazan, similar to what we were saying before. Worst comes to worst, if a person doesn't finish off the bracha of Gal Yisrael at the same time as the chazan, uh, they're not excommunicated from our people. Uh, they just say amen to the bracha, and that's okay. But so it's worthwhile as chazan to kind of say that last bracha, drop slow, so people who want to say it along with you can say it along with you. Um, any comments, questions about this? How? I noticed somebody I won't mention, but it was a very knowledgeable person who goes out of his way to add the amen yes. over there. And I suspect there's probably another... Uh, right, so so it, it it's so it's so there's two Ramas. So the traditional way in which the Ramas understood when you put it all together is that it's preferable to not say Amen to God, not be in a Amen situation for Gaal Yisrael, 
But if you were, you say amen to the bracha. That's, in my understanding, the most traditional way to understand the Ramah. There are those who understand the Ramah saying there's no preference here, and what's the big deal? Um, so that that's where 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 uh, my guess is I'm thinking the same person you're thinking of, which is wonderful because he's teaching us something which is great. Um, but uh, most people are prepared just to try to time go out Israel with, with the Kasa. Some have seen, but right, 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 right. So and and, and I want to make very clear I'm not saying for a moment that, that that approach is wrong. It's not wrong. It's definitely not wrong. But. Uh, um, if, if, if the chas is, is servicing the clientele, there's going to be some of the clientele who, a lot of the clientele who want to finish it off with the chas. Thank you. Yeah, I thought of the reason that you tail off on Goliath Israel so the congregation won't say Omei because if they do say Omei, it's an interruption. So here's the story. It's, it, it's, it's preferable for them to not be in a main situation. It's preferable for the chazan to do his job. Part of the chazan's job is to finish off things. By the way, specifically something that's a bracha. If you were thinking of what we were talking about before, about like these brachos, something like that. So it's really bizarre. Here's this very powerful bracha, and the chazan is whispering it that no one should hear him. It's, 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 it feels a little bit off, a little bit. You know, you know what I mean? But there's this question about, ah, you don't want to create an amen. So that's really where this Ramah comes in, that if a person hears Gwal Yisrael to answer amen, it's not a big deal. So... When you put it all together, it seems to make the most sense to say it nice and loud. From the perspective of the minion, let them just finish it off along with the chazan. There's no, there's no question of saying amen. But if a person is in time with the chazan, he, he, it would be appropriate to say amen. But it doesn't seem to make so much sense to whisper. Though there are, that is also a practice that some authorities say, but it does not seem to be the most, uh, the most encouraged practice. Um, how many people do you need with you? Great question. I'm so glad you raised that. Thank you very much. Um, I thought the reason, the reason that we should all come to shul is to hear the rabbi's sermon. Uh, Halacha does not seem to agree with that statement. Um, the, the greatest reason, the, uh, it's, it's always a surprise for people, the greatest reason to come to shul is not Kaddish, not Kedusha, it's the damage one say with the minions. So thank you very much. So there's an idea that when you start Shmona Esri, you should have a minion starting Shmona Esri with you. So when it's a smaller minion, it's definitely worthwhile to look around a little bit and see if there's actually a minion of people. And you can tell because people normally are standing up by that point. If they're still in their seats, they're, they're not. Uh, uh, so you should really see that there's a minion before you finish off Gala Yisrael. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mario. What about Chazar to Shatz in the morning? Okay, great. I'm glad you raised that too. Um, in terms of Chazar Shatz, you can't go wrong with a minion. In other words, counting the chasin. If you have a minion, by the way, that's not that's not always true. Truth be told, there are there is a constant halacha that if you have a minion, you should wait for the majority of the congregation to be finished before you start Chazar Shatz. Um, most of the time, we're not we're not so particular about that, but there is there is such a concept. It, but that notwithstanding, for a moment, if you have a minion, you're good. Um, there is a leniency in the context of Shachris and Mincha that if there's not a minion but nine and a tenth person is Davish Esrei, if you're under the gun, you can begin, uh, begin Shmon Esrei. <laughs> there's a further leniency for Marv because it's not a repetition of Shmon Esrei at that point, it's just the Kaddish. Afterwards, you can really go as little as seven uh, with three other people still Davish Shmon Esrei. But, um, seven including the Chazim? All this including the Chazim. Yeah. <clears throat> number six. Uh, there's discussion about it. There's discussion about it. If you have seven, it's pretty uh, seven, including the chazan. You know what I mean? It's, it's pretty or pretty reliable. Pretty reliable. Um, any other questions about Shema before we go on to Shema or Shmon Esrei before we go on to the next? Next thing is going to be the chazan's repetition. Okay. Um, okay. Let me just uh, mention one halacha that's always a good one to know because if it happens, it's very awkward and it's. It's not a good situation to ask a question. So is Rosh Chodesh. And you're davening Shabbos for the Ahmed on Rosh Chodesh. And you forgot to say Halvi Yavu in your private Shmona Esrei. And uh, you finish Shmona Esrei and you realize you forgot to say Halvi Yavu and you know the Allah is that you need to repeat Shmona Esrei if you forgot to say Halvi Yavu, but they're ready for you to start the Chassid's repetition. And, uh, and by the way, you know, the, the Metro bus is coming in you know, 15 minutes exactly, and what's going on, etc. So the bottom line is, the halach is, if you as an individual uh, omitted something which would require you to repeat Shmona Esrei, 
you can use the chazan's repetition. You, the chazan, can use your own repetition as a double for your private Shmon Esrei too. If, if, that, if, that, if that makes sense to everybody. Um, actually, it's a really interesting thing in general. The primary function of the chazan's silent Shmon Esrei is to prepare for the repetition. That, that's the way it's understood in Halacha. So just to mention an interesting shaila. let's say I don't daven the same nusach, the same text, as, um, as the minute that I'm davening. In other words, let's say I daven nusach sfar, and I'm davening in an Ashkenaz shul. So I know, out of respect to the, to the minion, I know in the chazan's repetition, I, I use the text that the minion uses. It would seem, there's discussion about it, but it would seem to make more sense in my silent Shmon Esrei to also use the text of the minion, even though that's not my personal nosah. Because the primary role of the chasen silent Shmon Esrei is actually to prepare him for his public repetition. Just an interesting, interesting side. Well, is it true that as long as you do Kedusha with, it, with everyone that you can, like, I do not doubt me so far. If I'm down silently, Yes, so thank you for raising that. If you're davening, that, that was all of you were the chasm. If you're, if you're davening silently, it's definitely, you could really do one of two ways. You can either totally daven your own nosach, except for the public, uh, public like publicly answered things, then you have to say what's, what, what, that they're, what they're saying, because it's considered disrespectful to be doing something different. The other thing you can do is for the general format, you can follow their nosach, and then when you get to the private, the silent one so right, then you do your own personal nosach. Yeah. When I go to the Sephardi Minion, I sit there with two sidurim. And then I was wondering if they're watching, you know, how much of the music wanted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's just, so for, when you're housing the Umara, and it's not your nosach, there's no preparation. So there'd be no, it, should, it you should do your own, your own personal nosach. Yeah, fully agreed. Yeah. Um, okay. So we have an introductory pasuk to Shmona Esrei, Hashem Svasai Tzav V'Yagiti Lasecha. And then, by the way, for Musaf and Mincha, we have an additional introductory pasuk, Kishem Hashem Ekrav Gold Elokeinu. The core introductory pasuk is Hashem Svasai Tzav. It is considered appropriate to say Hashem Svasai Tzav before the Chazis repetition. Even if it's Mosaf and Mincha, normally you don't say the Kishem Hashem Ekra as a chasen. You just say Hashem Sosai Tiftach. And the more common practice is to the more common practice is to say Hashem Sosai Tiftach quietly. In other words, you say the words, you know, you whisper it, but you don't say it loud. Some people say it loud. That's not wrong, but the more the more common practice is to say it quietly. By the way, the, the on the other end of it, it's also standard to before one steps out of their Shmona Esrei as the Chazen, it's also stands at Yudur HaTzon and Refi, Megyel Nebilu Fanech HaShem Tzuri Begoli, also more common to say that quietly, again, not, not loud. Um, okay. Also, excuse me, in Kedusha, you were talking about different types, different uh, times you vow. A lot of people um, who are leading and then you get to Zev Zev Yamar, and they do this left right thing, and there's nothing in halacha that says. It's yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's necessary to do. I know exactly what you're talking about. I don't think it's necessary to do that. Uh, I don't think it's bad, but I, I don't think there's, I don't think there's a constant. What there is a constant during kedusha is the you know going up and down kadosh kadosh kadosh, and baruch Hashem, Yeah, thank you. But but, uh, but halacha requires the first kadosh to rise up. Thing. I I think it's pretty standard to go up three times, but. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, a very, a very great challenge when doing the chasen's repetition, but it really is correct. I, when I say a bracha, and you say amen to my bracha, I'm not supposed to start the next bracha until you say amen. Now that might sound self-evident. I don't mean to put anybody on the spot tomorrow morning and show, but see what happens tomorrow morning and show. <laughs> it's actually not so common. Um, I understand that everyone's kind of under the gun, but whatever it is. But it, it makes sense at two levels. First of all, I, I make a bracha, and you say amen to affirm my bracha. Okay. Truth be told, my listening to your amen is somewhat of an affirmation of your affirmation, if, if you know what I mean. The other thing is, 
you're supposed to be listening to my next bracha. But if, if I'm halfway through the next bracha, by the time you're finished saying amen, it's just not so, so conducive and not so good. So that's, that's a good thing to think about. When you get, you know, yes, there are many times when the congregation doesn't respond to any bracha. That's a problem. For a long time, it's not. That, that, that's, a, that's a problem. Um, there's supposed to be, when we talk about the minion, it's supposed to be a minion, again, so the chas can count to the minion, but that's supposed to be nine people answering. Um, it really is a challenge sometimes. I mean, you're right. Uh, um, hopefully not, but, but it, is, it is a challenge. It's really supposed to be that the people are supposed to, people are supposed to answer. That's very true. Yeah. Let's say you're, you're in such a situation where you're the chasm and no one is answering or you, maybe like one person is answering. Should you just like sort of stop and look at people to sort of show, say to them, so. look, you guys, need to, you guys need to answer or I'm really not supposed to, to be, I mean, what do you do? I, I think you, you, David and then you should wake the people. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying yeah. that if, I, if that's what I do when I'm giving a speech and everyone is. <laughs> <laughs> So you're saying it's inappropriate to sort of stop and sort of stare and say, hey, look, guys, you need to, you got to use to answer. I think so. I think it's, I don't think it's going to get very far. I don't think it's going to work very well. I would discourage you. I, I just try to, you know, that's life. You know, we all try our best. We all try our best. Rick? How iron, I'm sure you have a totally unbiased uh, view on this question. How ironclad is the view that you have to wait till the rub is finished? Okay. <laughs> okay, so you've heard, heard of the Ten Commandments. Yeah. Eleventh, Eleventh Commandment. <laughs> the context for this is that I was one, the other uh, few days ago, and you were not nearly done. And the guy said, zoop, he just did, you know, start up again. I said, what's going on here? Really? I'm absolutely positive that I saw it. Really? Yeah. I said, what the heck's going on here? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe there was an imposter. I don't know. No, I, I don't I, I, I'm sure I saw it. But anyways. Uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, listen, it, 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 I, I was joking before. There's really no halacha concept of it. It's a common, common, uh, common middle class. I, I'm always... I always make them write it in my contract every time, but no, I'm just kidding. You know, but, but, uh, but, uh, um, it's a common. Uh, I will tell you that that um, it's always touching when people tell me how happy they were to see me at Shul and they post said, I came late, so it, was, it made me feel good because uh, you were there. I knew I had a few more minutes to work with, you know. So that was the you know it's a common refrain. You didn't, know, you didn't notice the, the stopwatch from the selection committee. <laughs> <laughs> By the same token waiting an instant for all name, you should wait after Hashem for work of Hashem. That is true. A lot of times, that's true. I've seen it just... Yeah. Don't don't truth be told, it. though, well, actually, in a way, it's probably worse with Baruch Hu because then what ends up happening, they don't wait for the chas, for the people to say Baruch Hu right. They finish the bracha, and they're still saying Baruch Hu Baruch Shmo, and, and, uh, and no one knows what, you know. Yeah, that's true. So, that, so, that's very true. Yeah, thank you. So you have to wait. You know, if you if you wait, you say Baruch Atah Hashem, and then they say Baruch Hu Baruch You have to wait for them to finish Baruch Hu Baruch before finishing the rest of the bracha. Yeah, that's the chaz. That would be appropriate. Now, every now and then, you have a person who who's decided to use your repetition as their audition, <laughs> and uh, they they have unique, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so you really don't have to. It's actually specifically stated in Allah that if there's one person giving this long. A main, and this is that you don't have to wait around for them. You keep on moving, but but uh, for the congregation in general, you're supposed to. That's that's very true. Yeah. Further in the chazis repetition modem. So so first of all, let me just clarify. This is not only true for the chazis; it's true for everybody. We bow at the words modim anach mulach. Um, by the way, the chazis baruch atah Hashem amachazir shchina solitzion. The response to amachazir shchina solitzion should not be modim anach mulach. The response to amachazir shchina solitzion should be a main. Amen. But that, that also is, is a common. Uh, um, now, the standard way it's said in halacha is the chazan is supposed to say the words of Modim out loud. Now, it's, it's a little bit tricky because the congregation is saying something. So maybe I should leave the congregation to themselves and I'll say my thing and they'll do their thing. So really, the halacha is the chazan is supposed to say the words of Modim, you know, the, 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 the chazan's paragraph of Modim out loud. Uh, it's traditional to kind of wait for a moment before the end of it. To let them finish, and then you could kind of end off uh, loudly. But you're really supposed to say all of it out loud. Um, I just want to get through a drop more, and then I'll pause again for questions. Thank you. Um, what I would like to speak about for a few moments is uh, Birchas Kohanim, okay, 
which of course uh, for Ashkenazim at least we only have in Yom Tovim, but it's, it's worthwhile to just, just get straight how it works. So if you're in the room and you're just watching the Chazan, the only word the Chazan says loudly from the time that he finishes the bracha of is Kohanim. Like, what's going on exactly? You know, so all those words that we normally say on a regular day of the Chazan's repetition, the Chazan is supposed to be saying all those words quietly to himself. And then when he gets to the word Kohanim, he says Kohanim out loud. And that's considered an invitation to the Kohanim. And uh, tr truth is, the, the congregation normally responds, Am Kedosh Echel I think it's correct for the Chazan to say actually quietly, Am Kedosh Echel I believe so. And then he starts saying the words of Birchaz Kohanim, and the Kohanim repeat after him. There's a very interesting thing. What's the story of that Kohanim? So that's an invitation. You're actually only supposed to do the invitation if there's at least two Kohanim present. So, because when the Torah talks about Birchaz Kohanim, it says, Amor Lahem. Say, so say is considered to be an invitation to them. Lahem to them, only if there's two or more. So you might have had the experience at times all of a sudden. There's one coin, and the chazan is just quiet. Now he should still be saying the words to himself. And then there's just a pause, and the Quran just start, or the coin, excuse me, just start. But that, that's the story with that. Um, okay, I just want to mention one more thing, one Khazar Sashabs, which is so we know that in our silent Shmon Esrei, when we're done with the Shmon Esrei, we take three steps back. And taking three steps back is like a closure of things. So where's the three steps back for the chazan? I actually mentioned earlier that every time there's a Shemona Esrei, there ultimately is a Kaddish to Skabel, which ultimately ends with the chazan taking three steps back. Truth be told, that Kaddish to Skabel is the closure and the three steps back for the chazan. So this is a little tricky, but technically speaking, a chazan is supposed to keep his feet together from the time that, of the end of his repetition until he gets the Kaddish to Skabo. Now, I know what you're thinking. What happens on Mondays and Thursdays? Good question. So, so there it's considered to be, you don't, you don't, what? Okay, well, well, no, how will I can stand with my feet together? The Mondays and Thursdays, so he does the chazan half his way to the, to the Aron to get the Torah, it's a little bit strange. So, uh, so there it's considered to be just what he's supposed to do. Um, so the walking there is considered related to the tefillah, so it's not considered a problematic thing. Um, but if at all possible, that's what a, a chazan is supposed to do. A chazan is supposed to keep his feet... But by the way, the practical application of that would be that on a Monday or Thursday, once the chazan brings the Torah to the bima, he shouldn't go wandering around the room. You know, he, I, I don't mean in any crazy way, I just mean he should basically stand near the bima, like he shouldn't... Uh, uh, and that would, that would make sense. If a person knows they're not going to be doubting at the end of doubting, it's actually very common two people have a chiyuv, or one person is only comfortable davening in the last part of davening, which means that if I'm the one who davened chakras, I'm not going to be the chasen when there's the kaddish to skabel. Right? In other words, if someone else is taking over ashram, it's not already, it makes sense for me to just take three steps back after, after my silent repetition. But by the way, either way, after my, after my, I'm sorry, after my public repetition, to take, to take thank you, to take uh, three steps back after my repetition, Either way, when the repetition is finished, it makes sense to say the Pasuk, as we said, to quietly say the Pasuk, you the Rats on Amri Fi. Yeah, the handoff would be right in Ashray. Right. So the repetition. Well, what about Ratachim? 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 I was in a situation actually more than once that um, I think I maybe came late to show, but I was asked to dab in just halal, because then after the chazans, chazan shots, I would come in and do halal. And then at the very end, I um, found the original chazan would come back and do kanish ti kabel. Uh, so that makes a lot of sense because the Makes a lot of sense. But now, but now, like you said, the, if there's a new chazan from Ashray, yeah. then shouldn't the first chazan come back and do a nah, I, don't, I don't think so. No. I don't think. I, I, it's, it's interesting. Just, it's just that we could, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so. I mean, I mean we can talk about it later if you like. I, I, we can talk about it 
greater length later if you like, but it's. Uh, so, so you said that the, the chaz is repetition, the chaz is not going to take precepts back before it was a shell? That's the standard way of Spartan Allah. That's you the, just said something that was different. That so now let's say, let's say I know someone else is thinking over at Ashram. So I don't get I don't get my Osa Shalom Kaj. So so when am I gonna take three steps back? So then it makes sense in that case, if I know that's gonna happen, it makes sense for me to take three steps back after my repetition. Yeah. Forgive me, I'm, I'm confused. Where where do you take the three steps back if you're the husband? Normally I take my three steps back at Kaddish to Skavo before I leave. In other words, after uh Kimi Olam Ukshin Kamonios? No, 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 no. I'm, 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 I'm repetition, and then Tachanun, and then Ashrei, and then Lamad Sayak, and then Avalot Zion Goel, and then the full Kaddish. This is not the end of the world, but this is, this is, this is the, this is, if, if you look at Allah, this is, this is, this is the way it is. Stand a Shemun Esher, not the end of the world. Okay, let's, let's, uh, I just want to, yeah. Should we do show? Thank you. Okay, let's talk about Kedusha. Thank you very much. Um, okay, how does it work in Kedusha? So it's important to realize that there are two types of lines in Kedusha. Lines that you say, no, I'm just... Uh, one, one type of line in Kedusha is um, a very important public recital. There are, there are three core components of Kedusha. The Pasuk of Kadosh, 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 the Pasuk of Baruch, Kod Hashem, and Kabo, and the Pasuk of Yimloch Hashem, the Yilom. Those are all very core to Kedusha. The other things are essentially invitations to the congregation to say the next part. Okay, now, the invitation to the congregation to say the next part, it's not essential to the chazan say it along with the congregation. It's not essential to the chazan be saying it with the congregation is saying it. But the psukim of Kadosh, 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 Baruch, Kvod, and Yimloch, the chazan should really be saying it as sort of part of the congregation, one comment. The other comment is, if there's anybody in the room who's still down in and can't answer to Kedusha, they're counting on the chazan to say it loud enough that they can live vicariously through him, similar to how we discussed the Yeshmei Rabbah before. So therefore, when you get to the lines of Kadosh, 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 Baruch, Kvod, and Imloch, it's appropriate for the chazan, A, to say it very loud and clear, like uniquely so, B, to begin while the minion is still saying the verse, so he can say it as part of the congregation, but C, to say it as they're finishing off saying the verse, or saying whatever they're saying, so that if people need him, there's, not, there's, there's, enough, there's enough of a limit of competition with his voice that people can actually hear him. So you can lag a beat or two behind. Yeah, probably more than a beat or two. Hmm. In other words, when you think about, well, well on, on the weekday, yeah, a beat or two. On Shabbos, it, they're going. I mean, they, 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 it's, a, it's a while. So you want to jump in with Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh near the end of their lengthy thing. If that, if that makes sense. Stuart. So the Shulman and Baruchim, the Hasan on Shabbos is doing um, you know, Musaf Kedusha. No one in the congregation is saying along with him because you had to hear him sing his line. And here, everybody sings along and you couldn't get out the Hasan. You can't hear the Hasan say a thing. Um, I'm not so so worried about that. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not so, I mean, I hear you. Um, I mean, the one thing that makes sense to hear him say science is the, the, the very last, the very last few words. You know, Luma Sam Shavchim Omrim, you know, you know, but Divrei Kachachach Asuvle more. But even then, you know what he's saying. I mean, it's, I don't know if it's so, I don't know if it's so terrible. You just said it was important to hear it, so I... No, I was talking about the Psukim, the Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. But that's what people were saying. No, Sometimes, no. Sometimes. Sometimes. I think I think if you were to ask me, let me let me take a step back. If you were to ask me, what would be ideal for what a chazan would sing and what a chazan wouldn't sing, I would say it would be ideal for the chazan to not sing kadosh 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 baruch kvod and gimloch those sentences. Then the the words subsequent to each of those sentences. You know, mimkomcha, mimkomo, kvodo, all these things like, you know, they're not in the bold print. I think it's perfectly fine for him to sing those. Uh, it probably does make sense, specifically the, the, the pasuk itself of each of those three psukim. By the way, I wouldn't include Shema Yisrael in that. Shema Yisrael, I don't think it's a big deal at all. Shema Yisrael is not actually not core to the Kedusha. It's, it's a very nice pasuk, but it, we, we believe in it, but it's, 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 not, it's not core to the Kedusha. Um, 
But I do think it makes sense for the Chazan not to sing those three psukhs that they refer to. I think that's true. I would agree with that statement. Yeah. Anything else about Kedushah? Um, there are three Kedushahs, which is Gamina, Kedushah, 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 Hashem Al-Khambari, based on the same idea, but then the Shema, <coughs> when there isn't any Hashem in love, until right before the end of the day, yeah, Hashem Al-Khambari, Hashem Al-Khambari, it's very small, according to this world. Is that, is that supposed to be a, excuse me, a long Kedusha, kind of like that, where the, the last name of Hashem is all the way farther ahead? Possible. I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, I will tell you that, uh, it's an interesting point, Yoni. I will tell you that Kadosh, 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 and Baruch Kavod are on a much higher tier within the Kedusha than Yimloch. You know, even, even in the Kedusha of Chazar Shatz, which has all three, it's clearly in Halacha, a much higher tier. I'm not sure it's an interesting point. I'm not okay, sure. Okay, I noticed it because in the Nats of Europe, they, they bold the lines. Yeah. And I noticed that Hashem Muhammad was bolded as the one line that's bolded yeah. on the page. Yeah. No, it's, it's a fair point. It's, it's definitely a fair point. Uh, thank you. Um, okay, I want to talk uh, for a few moments about Tachanun. Uh, Tachanun is very confusing. What's the chasm supposed to be doing during Tachanun? Let me just explain what I'm getting at. So we know the chasm normally stands. That seems to be part of the job description. Um, we know there's a part of Tachanun where you go like this, and traditionally you do that sitting. So how does this work out? By the way, there's also part of Tachanun, forget the chasm for a second, but your average guy in the shul, there's a part of Tachanun where you go like this, there's a part of Tachanun where you're sitting, just sitting up, and then there's a part where you're standing. So, what does the chazan do? So, let, let me just, it's late already. So, so, the most standard approach is the part where you go like this, the chazan finds a seat. The chazan finds a seat and goes like this also. But then, the, after the part that you go like this, where the rest of the people are just sitting up, I believe the most common thing is for the chazan at that point to go back to the Ahmed and say the rest of it, standing as is his position for the rest of but specifically the part that you go like this, the chazan traditionally also finds a seat to go like that for. So is everyone with me on that? that that's a, um, so he shouldn't just stand at the end of it? Like no, the, I, I do see people do that. I'm not saying that's wrong, but I think the more commonly, thing, the commonly done thing is to go and sit. Uh, by the way, I should mention also, somebody was asking about this recently, they were absolutely right. Um, there was actually a concept brought in the halacha of it's a nice thing for the congregation to begin the sitting tachan, like on a Monday or Thursday, it's a nice thing to begin the same tachan together as a congregation, which means that it just makes sense for the chasm when he finishes the standing part of tachan on a Monday or Thursday, just to say the last words. You know, take it or leave it, you know, you know but, but, but there's such a concept. Um, I just want to end off with a few snippets. One is, this is something Yoni was referring to before, Uvalot Yon Goel, which is right near the end of the weekday davening, there are a few sukkim that are like in bold, in, in Uvalot Yon Goel. Those are supposed to be said out loud as a congregation, so it's important for the chasm to kind of end up before each of those people and say it out loud. And the last thing, and then I'm happy to open it up for a few questions in the last, these last few minutes, um, um, humbly, one of the most commonly mispronounced word confusions in my experience in Davide, that actually that really does make a difference, is the very end before Shemona, I say, Baruch HaTu Hashem, Ga'al Yisrael. Ga'al Yisrael means he redeemed Israel. He saved us from Egypt, right? There's a bracha in Shmona Esrei, Baruch HaTu Hashem, Go'el Yisrael, the Redeemer of Israel. So those are two different words, I just want to point that one out. Um, and uh, being critical, uh, Baruch Hashem, that makes you even more critical, because I, as I'm saying, I have another one I just want to share. Um, um, the, the end of Tachanun, Ozreinu, Ozreinu, Hashem Elokeinu al Tvarkfo Shemecha. If I'm getting the words right? Um, yeah. Ozreinu. Yeah. Ozreinu means help us. There's another place in Davin where I'm blanking out where it is, where it's Ezreinu. Thank you. Ezreinu means you are our help. So those Ozreinu and Ezreinu are also two different words. I just want to point that out. Any, any other uh, comments, questions? My... Someone once told me, and I can't remember where it was, it was in yeshiva, they said that if people who do this, right, and they, they're not putting their arm down, 
it's he said it's push it wrong, and I see so many people doing it. I'm, I'm wondering if, with, did we say great? He said if tachanun is you're falling on your face. You, this is that you're not falling on anything. You're putting your hand up to your to your, to your head. You're supposed to put your arm down on something and then put your head down on your arm. Is what I was told um, is proper. I was, it's probably said, correct. And he, and he said he said at least some kind of bending downwards. So that seems to be true. It seems to be true. So in other words, is what, that, is what he said correct when he said he said people who do this. It's like he says you're not doing tachanun at all. You're not. You're not falling on your face. Uh, it's probably true. It's, you're probably correct about that. That's true. Yeah. yeah. So probably correct. I mean, I don't know if you have to really be whatever, but it's some level of bending downwards. I don't. You're okay. Uh, Paita condition. Ah. What? Because it comes up. Paita condition. Paita condition. Yeah. Let me. Let me. Let me just translate. Yeah. People. Um. People have it a different. way. Perhaps at workplace, but now it happens sometimes. Sometimes at weddings and things like that, it happens where it's like an inverted thing. Where, where, whereas normally you say Ashrei Kaddish, silence when I say Chazan's repetition, Ashrei Kaddish, the Chazan goes straight into his thing until Kedusha, and then everybody answers Kedusha, and then everyone's quiet again. Um, yes, please, I just want to make sure we're all no, no, the same. No, yeah, yeah. No, because, I mean, we do it in NIH every day. Um, so the Chazan is supposed to say the uh, door after the Kedusha, correct? As opposed to saying a Kedush? Always mix this up. <laughs> always mix this up. I always mix this up. I, you know, I'm, I'm scared I'm going to give you the wrong answer. I, I, I confuse it a lot. I apologize. Um, I, I have to double check. I'm sorry. I always uh, sorry. In my workplace, they normally have a full. Uh, <laughs> but I, but I have it. I have it easier in so many ways. Yeah. But that's not fair. Is the national tour of halacha is he talking about? I'm sorry. So the national tour of halacha. Very good. <laughs> NIH. National tour. But um, uh, I, 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 I believe that, or I'll, 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 I'll yeah. Uh, back to uh, back to Kaddish, and I don't want to embarrass him, but a shout out to Shmuley here for spearheading this notion that we should do it. And the unit. It's really, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. just a wonderful thing, and I'm really glad that he's. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for mentioning he's it. He's like the man on this. I don't embarrass him. Yeah, they know. It's, 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 it's a very, I, I, must, I must just tell you, we, 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 I, never, I didn't want to legislate it, but if there's anyone for whom it's relevant, we, we it really was show his initiative <coughs> very much. But uh, I can't tell you, I've gotten complaints for years in Shul. You know, it's so hard. People are. are from the Kaddish sayers, the Kaddish listeners, you know, it's so confusing and this and that. So, um, so uh, what we do now, again, for anyone who wants, people don't want, it's fine, but, but this kind of like, the, the Kaddish sayers kind of c congregate together, and it, uh, I, I think it's, I think it's probably easier for the Kaddish sayers, I think it's certainly easier for the Kaddish listeners, so thank you, thank you, Rick, thank you very much. Any, anything else? Uh, uh, next, next. This that one person, even more clarity, one person says it on behalf of the congregation, uh, yeah. and, and they take turn because they serve a condition. They can right. Say, that was the it used to be the standard practice in Cloud Israel. That was the standard practice in Cloud Israel. It's very interesting. There's all these halachas about who has priority to daven for the Ahmed. The real origin of the halachas is actually not daven for the Ahmed. The real origin of the halachas is who has priority in terms of saying the Kaddish, the Kaddish, the, the, to be the Kaddish sayer. Um, most, most minyanim and shows of Klai Shrove don't do that anymore. The Yakis still do it. The Yakis, they have... I uh... went to Washington Heights and they looked at me... Oh boy! I bet they did! I bet they did! I'm glad you made it back, Max. But... <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe this is okay. <laughs> No, 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 Max, I, I bet we were all the mourners' Kadeshim. Right. Oh. But they let me take one. <laughs> right, they, they probably invited you to be part of the rotation. And, and, and uh, yeah, no, it's a very interesting thing. But it was negotiable. <laughs> you, can appreciate why, you can appreciate why that was the practice. You can appreciate why places still do it. You can appreciate, on the other hand, how I'm, I'm sure there were people who found it very frustrating that they, they uh, it could be a home. In a big place, it could be a whole day went by a person to get to say Kaddish. I mean, you can imagine, you know, if there's a lot of other people, so you can appreciate why the practice kind of developed differently over time, but uh, you can imagine both sides of it. Um, okay, I, I definitely don't want to hold people past nine, so let, let's, uh, if, if, if the Chazanim need to keep to a schedule, the, the, the presenter also does. But thank you very much again, Yashu Kovach, the steward for the idea, and uh, thank you very much for coming. Oh, next week. Next week.